Deanne, great to have you with us. Uh, we now have the details of phase one and big questions being raised over whether we will manage to move on to phase two. Does phase one as it stands, is that enough for you to maintain your relatively optimistic view of global growth in 2020? Yes, that is our assumption that we will uh, have phase one stay in place, uh, so no renewed escalation, but we're also not building in a um, uh, you know, substantial comprehensive agreement that goes uh, much beyond um, phase, phase one. So uh, we think the two sides are probably still a little too far apart for uh, a much more comprehensive deal. But the key for us is that the continued escalation of 2019 you know, progressively weighed on, on growth in the U.S., in China, in other places, uh, probably to the tune of around half a percentage point in the U.S. or China by the end of the year. That's the impact on the annualized uh, sequential growth pace. And with this phase one deal, um, and assuming no renewed escalation, uh, we think that number goes towards zero. So that's effectively a subtraction of negatives as far as the growth outlook is concerned. And I think it contributes to acceleration. And that acceleration, Jan, a very good morning to you. You say your 2020 outlook is a little bit more mixed than your relatively sanguine view on both recession and central bank policy might suggest. Can I ask you, from a global perspective, as phase one passes now and we enter phase two, how do you see global central bank policy this year? Because I think Nero did an interview yesterday with Alberto Gallo, and, and, and I think he said that QE around the world was a little bit like Manchester United, still printing money, uh, but uh, you know, not exactly having a bang for its buck. So central bank policy on the back of phase one, globally, first of all, we'll deal with the Fed in a moment. Well, phase one is what we had built into our numbers. And, you know, on the back of that and other views on, on the economic outlook, we're basically expecting very little from the developed market central banks. No moves from the, uh, from the Federal Reserve, no moves from the ECB, no moves from the Bank of Japan, uh, probably also no moves from the Bank of England, although uh, there's more of a question around that in the near term, given the weak data and the dovish commentary. But for the most part, we think 2020 uh, is going to be uh, pretty stable in terms of uh, interest rates and central bank policy. Jan, uh, when it comes to China, you say that in contrast to the US and Europe, China is unlikely to see a meaningful sequential acceleration in 2020. Talk to us about the spillovers of that to the rest of the region and the world. Well, I'm not sure there are huge spillovers because we're not talking about large changes in the, in the growth pace. I mean, on an annual average basis, our expectation is that China goes from a little above 6% in 2019 to a little below 6% in 2020. Sequentially, if you just look at the, uh, the, the change from one quarter to, to the next, um, basically a sideways move. So I don't think there are, there are any major spillovers of this. Um, what is notable is that many places in the emerging world we think are getting somewhat better after a very weak 2018, uh, 2019. Latin America is an example. India is an example of, uh, of countries that should look a little bit better. Uh, China is an exception to that. So uh, I think that is noteworthy. But at the same time, I wouldn't necessarily expect major negative spillovers from it either. Um, from a inflation perspective, Jan, my last guest from Macquarie said to me, um, look, this phase one trade deal allows the nascent reflation that we're seeing on the world to, to hold. And I suppose my question to you is, will 2020 be a year, and we've touched on this with a few guests, where we see more inflation around the world as we pass through some of these hurdles? Well, I think relative to the latest kind of uh, spot numbers on, on core inflation in the US uh, and the most widely followed PCE index is at 1.6% at the moment. Relative to that, I think we'll see some acceleration, partly because the PCE index relative to some of the other indicators of core inflation is sort of towards the bottom of the range and we expect some convergence there, partly because the economy continues to make headway, the unemployment rate is uh, at the lowest level in 50 years, probably going to come down a little bit more from three and a half percent now to maybe three and a quarter. Uh, so, you know, all of that argues for some pickup in, in inflation. That said, the starting point is 
uh, 40 basis points below the Fed's target. So even if you were to move up uh, to that target, uh, that would actually be desired from the Fed's perspective. So it wouldn't make them nervous and uh, convince them that they would have to tighten policy anytime soon. Jan, how much will the Eurozone and Germany in particular benefit from the signing of phase one? We have had some data points in Germany recently, factory orders, for example, that have caused some concern uh, and caused people to question whether we have seen the bottoming in that manufacturing cycle. It does seem that things are bottoming out in the German numbers and more broadly in the European numbers. Some of the uh, industrial indicators, as you say, are looking a little bit better. Uh, some of the surveys have picked up quite a bit. Not so much the current activity components of that, but at least the forward-looking bits uh, point to, to some rebound. And we would expect a, a pickup in sequential growth from you know, maybe half a percent or so if we look at all of the different indicators together in the euro area uh, and probably still negative in, uh, in, in Germany. Um, again, if we put some weight on the high frequency indicator, that's the current pace. We think that probably rises to, uh, to the you know, one, one and a quarter percent uh, pace uh, range in the, in the euro area. So things are getting better at the margin. Uh, and, but you know, so far it has not been, a, certainly not a V-shaped recovery, but really something more U-shaped. And phase one, um, I think, should, um, you know, again, it's part of our baseline assumption, so it doesn't really change our outlook, but it is uh, a constructive step that should also help uh, things get a little bit stronger. So, Jan, just uh, continuing the conversation a little bit about Europe, one of the thing, themes that we've touched on is this, I suppose, momentum in the burnt market back towards zero. I look at the inflation, the break-evens in Europe. We're at 1.08, the highest level in more than eight months. Is this perhaps one of the more underpriced risks uh, in, in the inflation or the reflation story? I mean, we're not expecting a big and rapid increase in European inflation. It still seems that uh, the... Uh, you know, the economy is further away from full employment than uh, other advanced economies, U.S., U.K., Japan. Unemployment rates, uh, especially in the periphery, are still relatively high. I think um, while wage growth has picked up, uh, it continues to be softer than in the, the U.S. Or the, or the U.K. So, you know, I think over time, inflation is probably going to move gradually higher towards 2 percent. But right now, it's still very close to 1 percent. Uh, and so I think that is probably going to cap the upside for, uh, for break-even inflation as well. Um, we do think that break-even inflation still has room to rise in, uh, in the U.S. in particular. Uh, we've been positive on that. There's been uh, re a rebound there as well, and we think there's still some, some room to go for some of the reasons that I outlined earlier in talking about U.S. inflation. 